Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Gradient Podcast. We interview various people who research, build, or use AI, including academics, engineers, artists, entrepreneurs, and more. I am Andre Krankov, a fourth-year PhD student at the Stanford Vision and Learning Lab, and your host. In this episode, I'm excited to be interviewing Professor Jan Lacun. Jan Lacun really needs no introduction, so I'll keep it pretty brief. He is the VP and Chief AI Scientist at Facebook and Civil Professor at NYU University, and he was also the Founding Director of Facebook AI Research and of the NYU Center for Data Science. He famously pioneered the use of convolutional neural nets for image processing in the 80s and 90s, and is generally regarded as one of the people whose work was pivotal to the deep learning revolution. And there are other accolades and titles to mention, of course, but uh, I think that's enough for now. So thank you so much for joining us for this interview, Professor Lacun. It's a pleasure. Okay, so um, one question I've uh, grown fond of asking just about anyone, especially academics here, and one thing that I'm not aware of as far as your background, so it would be interesting, is before all the, you know, CNNs, uh, all the deep learning, uh, you know, early on, how did you get into research and how did you get interested in AI and, and you know, actually start looking into AI research? Right. Yeah. I mean, I was always interested in science and uh uh, and, you know, various aspects of science and physics and, um, you know, astrophysics in particular and, um, you know, fascinated by the question of intelligence and how it emerged in in humans and animals and things like that. I mean, a lot of questions I was really fascinated by. But um, but when I went to college, I, um, I I chose engineering because I I'm an engineer at heart. I like building things. Um, but I discovered while studying engineering that I was more interested in research than in, uh, you know, regular engineering, if you want. And so um, I, 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 I was always kind of wondered about the you know, idea of intelligence and, and things like that, uh, uh, being convinced that learning is an essential part of, of intelligence. Um, and I stumbled onto a few books that uh, talked about First of all, machine learning, it, it, it wasn't called that way at the, at the time, but I stumbled on a book, which was actually a philosophy book. It was a debate between the nature and nurture between uh, Noam Chomsky, the famous linguist, and, uh, and Jean Piaget, the, the Swiss developmental, developmental, developmental psychologist. And they, they were arguing as to whether language is innate or, or, or learned. On the side of Piaget was a guy arguing for the learning uh, aspect uh, uh, called Seymour Papert. He was from MIT, and a, and th this debate took place in the late 70s, 1979, I think. And um, and Piaget was uh, uh, sorry, Papert was basically praising the perceptron. He mentioned the perceptron in this article, <laughs> saying that you know it was a surprisingly simple little machine that was capable of learning surprisingly complex um, uh, concepts. Uh, and I looked at this and I realized people had thought about machines that could learn and I was fascinated by it. So I started kind of digging the literature. I must have been in second or third year of college um, and, uh, and discovered that uh, all publications on that domain had stopped in the late 60s and, and Peppert was partially responsible for it because he wrote the book that basically killed it. <laughs> yeah. So it was a bit of a surprise, but um, it's a very good book, by the way. Um, Septron, co-authored with Marvin Minsky. Uh, and by the time, uh, you know, this was early 80s, uh, by that time, uh, a new, you know, another kind of movement in AI was starting, which was kind of logic-based uh, expert systems and stuff like that. And it was starting to kind of get hot, actually. Um, but I thought, this is all wrong. Like, there is no learning. Like, how can we build intelligent machines if, we, if, they, can't, if they can't learn? Um, uh, so I... You know, I already had this idea somehow that um, uh, maybe because I'm lazy or because I'm uh, uh, realistic about my own abilities, uh, I, I didn't think it was possible to build an intelligent machine by engineering it. I always thought the machine had to basically build itself through learning. So I got fascinated by things like, you know, self-organizing systems and uh and then, you know, neural nets. And little did I know that a, a small group of people uh, in the U.S., uh, I was aware of uh, works of that type in Japan that I kept going, actually. Um, but I didn't know people in the U.S. were kind of restarted working on this 
um, a little in secret, people like Jeff Hinton and Terry Sanofsky and Jay McClelland and David Warmerheart. But I, I kind of, you know, got in touch with them. Then, then I started a, a graduate program where I really wanted to work on this and I couldn't find anybody to be my advisor because nobody knew anything about this. I found someone who, Maurice Miguel, I'm a very nice guy who said, I can sign the papers, but I can't help you. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. So I was really isolated. That's how I came to it. Interesting. Yeah. So you got inspired basically by discovering Perceptron, which kind of is one of the first really AI accomplishments. And then, yeah, um, seeing that no one else was doing learning at, in the early 80s and then kind of had to correct that, I suppose. Yeah. I got in touch with a, a small independent lab in, in Paris. Uh, it was, it was a informal thing where people who had positions in universities were kind of getting together to think about what they call automata networks. So this was, uh, you know, there's like cellular automata and things like this. Basically, the automata network is this general idea that you have a complex collective phenomenon emerging from the interaction of a large number of very simple elements. And that's really also what neural nets are about. So these people were interested in this. So I kind of hook up with them and they, they helped me with, you know, things like finding a good graduate school and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and stuff like that. Interesting. And then, uh, so you got started looking, I guess, in the early eighties and then a few, I think mid eighties, uh, maybe towards the end of eighties, uh, back propagation got big. So did that, also happen as you were graduating or, or I guess you were part of that, right? I was, I was kind of part of that. So I, I came up with, uh, um, so, I mean, I realized pretty early that the reason why uh, the early attempts in the sixties, uh, a neural net had basically withered is because people were looking for running rules for multi networks and they couldn't find one essentially. And I kind of found one, which uh, we would now call uh, target prop. So it's the idea that you don't backpropagate gradient, you backpropagate virtual targets for every neuron, essentially. So you can have a multi-layer net. And you know, for every neuron in the in the network, you say, what value should this neuron take right now to satisfy the outputs? Right? So that the you know, whatever desired output is uh, is easier to compute from that value. And so you can you can derive algorithms like this that kind of backpropagate targets. Uh, and so I, I kind of made up an algorithm like this. And then I realized like, you know, if you make everything continuous inside, so I was using binary neurons, mostly because the computers I had access at the time could not do multiplication efficiently. <laughs> so, um, if you have binary neurons, you only need to do additions, right? It's, it's easier, faster. You can do it in integer and everything. So, uh, so I didn't think of this. Um, and, but then I realized like, if you make everything continuous, uh, what you can backpropagate is gradient. And. And I made connections of this with some algorith classical algorithms in optimal control from the 1960s. And, uh, and before I had time to experiment and publish this, I met Jeff Hinton, who told me what he was doing at the time. So this was 1987. Um, I had published my target prop algorithm in 1985. No, this was 1985, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, just, I just published my uh, target prop algorithm. Um, and Jeff um, saw it and he was in France for a conference and, and we hooked up and he, he told me what he was doing. And, and as he was explaining, I was kind of completing his sentences and saying, <laughs> yeah. exactly what you're doing. Um, um, so I was kind of scooped a little bit, but, uh, but in a good way, because then he kind of offered me a job for postdoc. So, um, Interesting. Yeah, I, I recall when I was looking into the history of deep learning, being uh, surprised a little bit by finding out you had this thesis that was sort of like backprop before the famous 1986 publication, which I think was in French, right? Which is part of why it wasn't as well known. Yeah, the, that publication that uh, Jeff uh, saw at this conference was in French. It was very badly written. It's very amateurish in many ways, but it had this idea of propagating targets and it's, you know, formally very similar to, to backprop in a kind of a limit case. Mm -hmm. And then I had a second paper in, uh, which appeared in 86, I, I wrote it in 85, um, proceeding of a workshop where I, I made the connection with, I mean, I read it as backprop as well and things like that. But, um, and this was, you know, shortly before um, the Rommel Hartington Williams paper kind of appeared. Mm -hmm. But by then I had, I had spoken to Jeff, so I, I knew what he was doing and, you know, 
Yeah, uh, regardless of the impact of a paper, it, it got you connected to Jeff yeah. and, and the rest is kind of history. Um, and just a little bit more since we're on this trend. Um, I know the initial publication on CNNs was uh, late 80s, I think 89. And uh, yeah, I'm wondering when that started germinating uh, in your head. I know there was the New York Cognitron uh, yeah. from the early 80s. So yeah, kind of curious how that came about. Well, pretty early because, you know, when I was uh, like spending a lot of free time in libraries kind of, you know, going through the literature of the 1960s. I also kind of looked at, uh, you know, uh, computational neuroscience um, or, or theoretical neuroscience group, you know, the work of, you know, Eric Kendall on synaptic adaptation and, and Hubel and Wiesel on the architecture of the visual cortex and then discovered the cognitron, neurocognitron. Uh, and it was kind of obvious, you know, also from signal processing, right, for like filtering is convolution, blah, 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 right? So it was pretty obvious that if you wanted to build a, a neural net to do perception, vision in particular, this idea of having kind of local connections uh, was not only biologically suggested by biology, but also by signal processing. And it was due to the nature of uh, image, images where you have lo strong local correlations, right? Um, and then the idea that, you know, you should replicate the weights because uh, the st statistics are the same all over this pretty natural idea uh, also that existed in the neocognitron. Also was proposed in actually one of the original backprop paper, one of, uh, you know, Jeff, Jeff Hinton's papers for the, the, the TC problem. It was a very simple demonstration. He also worked on something called TDNN, which is sort of a temporal version of a uh, convolutional net, right? Time delay neural net. So, so th these ideas were kind of floating around. The, the, the thing is, you know, how, how do you make it work, right? I mean, uh, so I started, um, before I, I finished my PhD, six months before, when I was writing my thesis, I met uh, Leon Botou. So he's kind of a pretty famous guy now, but um, he was finishing his, his um, engineering degree as well. And, um, and he wanted to work on neural nets. And together we started implementing a, basically a, a neural net simulator, what we would now call a, a deep learning framework, okay? Um, which uh, a system called SN, eventually we open sourced it in the early 2000s under the name Lush. And it, it was, you know, basically kind of uh, sort of a, a neural net numerical manipulation engine, which eventually became a, a tensor engine, actually, not, the, not in the first version, but eventually. And with a front end language, which was a Lisp interpreter that we wrote, because uh, at the time you didn't have Python, you didn't have any of that stuff, right? You had to write your own language, basically. So. Uh, we started doing this when I was finishing my PhD, and then I moved to Toronto, and I kind of finished this. And what I wanted to do with this, the reason I was building this, is because I wanted to implement conditional nets. That's really what I wanted to do. If already in my PhD uh, thesis, I had a network architecture that had local connection, but it didn't have shared weights, and it wasn't trained with sort of pure backprop, if you want. So I wanted something that could do could do backprop, could do recurrent nets, could do conditional nets, um, you know, could do all that stuff um, before it was called conventional nets, right? Could do shared weights, essentially. Um, and so I worked for six months when I was uh, in Toronto and, and, and Jeff was kind of wondering what I was doing. <laughs> I apologize if there's an alarm going on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. um, you know, Jeff was wondering what I was doing because I was kind of hacking, right? <laughs> all, all the time. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, and that allowed me to basically implement the first, uh, the first convolutional net. So I did this when I was in Toronto, um, tested this on a small data set that I collected myself by drawing characters with a mouse. And then when I got at Bell Labs, um, they, the, they had a data set of, you know, a few thousand samples, which at the time was ridiculously large. And I experimented with that. You know, I had the code ready. And uh, within two months, I, I had the best results that anybody had gotten on that data set. So... Um, that was the end of 1988, right after I joined Bell Labs. Cool. Yeah. So you basically had to build your own PyTorch, your own TensorFlow. Yeah, you didn't yeah. have all this infrastructure <laughs> that us young kids these days right. can leverage. Incidentally, by the way, Torch and PyTorch, and to some extent TensorFlow and Cafe2 and Cafe, are basically descendants of this thing that Leo and I wrote. Uh, a lot of a lot of it is mm. inspired by that, actually. Yeah, it sounds like it was basically the first of these sort of frameworks. Yeah. We had this idea of, you know, you have uh, objects and you, you connect them in a graph and you get automatic differentiation by just going backwards in the graph. And underneath you have a tensor engine and, you know, you do everything this way and you have kind of a convenient front-end language to control it. Cool. Yeah, very interesting. So 
Uh, that's some good background, sort of early days. And now I was thinking we could jump back, uh, jump to the present and what's going on in deep learning recently. And something you've been discussing a lot and it seems to focus on, which is self-supervised learning. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, as I see it, there's been this interesting trend of, um, you know, obviously in NLP, it's been going on for a few years. And I was actually listening to your interview with Lex Friedman from about two years ago, and you were saying, you know, it works in NLP, it doesn't work in computer right. vision yet, yet. <laughs> at that point, not yet, uh, in 2019. Um, so first, I guess, would you say now it's working in vision to some extent? Yeah, or, to some or extent. Is it still? Um, I mean, there are certainly a lot of exciting things happening uh, in the domain of uh, self-supervised learning for, for vision. It's not yet the case that with self-supervised learning, you can beat uh, what, you can, what you can get with, with supervised, mostly because we have huge labeled data sets, right, in image recognition. But there are other areas like speech recognition where the supervised learning clearly is bringing a lot to the table. It allows us to train, you know, speech recognition systems with only 10 minutes of labeled uh, speech, which is kind of amazing. Um, so there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, uh, within a couple of years, basically all domains of uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning will use some sort of self-supervised learning. It's already the case in NLP. Um, it's starting to become the case in speech and uh, pretty soon in, in vision as well. The big, the big challenge is, you know, how can we get machines to learn how the world works by watching videos, essentially? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, the trend is obviously pointing in yeah. this direction where everything is pre-trained uh, with this approach. Um, so yeah, maybe starting, uh, there's a couple papers that seem to uh, explore in Vision 2020. So I was thinking we could delve into it. But before that, uh, I was curious sort of uh, if you could sort of recap, how would you define self-supervised learning and why you think it is so promising? Uh, I know you have a cake metaphor. But, <laughs> right. uh, yeah, maybe just for the listeners. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I gave a, a number of talks, you know, for the last five, six years around, around this, this very idea. But uh, basically, um, you know, if you train a system using reinforcement learning, you're only giving a feedback to the machine once in a while, right? And it's a single scalar value. And so... The, the sample complexity of pure reinforcement learning is just ridiculous. It's, you know, you need, you know, the equivalent of tens of thousands of years of real time uh, training for, you know, a robot to learn anything, basically. And that's completely impractical in the real world. Um, so, you know, there's a recent paper by, you know, very prominent people from DeepMind, um, you know, the lead author being David Silver saying reward is enough. And I absolutely 100% completely disagree with this. I think this is completely wrong. I'm not going to go into this just now, but uh, now yeah, reward is enough in theory, you know. <laughs> this is the only discussion. Uh, yeah. Now there's supervised learning, and supervised learning you only supply the machine with a small number of bits per sample, and then uh, self-supervised learning is the idea that you use supervised learning, but you use supervised learning to get the machine to learn to basically predict part of its input from another part of its input. Okay. And when I say predict, it doesn't mean necessarily reconstruct. It needs model the dependency between different parts of the input, right? So it could be a model that says, like, you know, I give you the left part of, of an image and the right part of an image, and the model tells you, is this right part compatible with the left part? Okay, is it a good completion of the image? Or, or you give it an initial segment of a video, and then you propose a continuation, and it tells you, yeah, this is a good continuation, or not, this is not a good continuation. If a system has been, is capable of telling you this, that means it has captured the dependency you know, between, between things. So if it sees in that video an object that follows a completely unphysical trajectory, it will tell you that's not physical. So I understand physics, so, you know, um, not, not possible. Um, so that's the basic idea of uh, self-supervised learning. You basically use, self, you use supervised learning in some way, um, but you, you, you supervise the system to predict part of the input from another part of the input. So until about a year ago, or maybe a little earlier than that, I was a big fan of uh, kind of generative models, by which I don't mean probabilistic models. I need models that actually produce uh, the, the thing to be predicted. So if you want to you know, predict a, a system to do video prediction, uh, to train a system to do video prediction, you show it a video clip and you train it to predict the next frame on the next few frames or some frames in the future. And the problem with this, of course, is that there are many frames in the future that are compatible with an initial uh, clip. 
And so the question is, how do you deal with the uncertainty in the prediction? Um, the, the, the logical way of uh, representing uncertainty is by parameterizing the set of plausible predictions through a latent variable. And as you vary the latent variable over a set or over a distribution, the output varies over a corresponding set. Okay, So that's a way to represent a collection of predictions instead of a single one. Um, it turns out that doesn't work very well if you want to train a system to predict video, or even if you want to train a system to uh, learn from uh, data augmentation, right? So you would like, give, it a, give an image and then give a distorted version of the image and then train a system to basically predict the distorted version from the original version, run it through an encoder and then run it through a decoder that predicts the distorted version. You, perhaps you feed it with the parameters of the distortion or something. Um, it doesn't work very well. Uh, there's been a lot of attempts uh, through autoencoders uh, or various types, masked autoencoders, denoising autoencoders, you know, various approaches, GANs, right, of attempting to learn good representations of images through reconstruction or prediction. None of those things work, or at least they don't work very well. Not well enough, yeah. That's right. And the stuff that works is uh, something, you know, uh, Jeff Hinton and I kind of worked on in the early 1980s, 1990s, sorry, uh, called joint embedding uh, or metric learning. Uh, so basically you have two neural nets, uh, you show it the two things, the thing you're observing and the thing you want to predict. You're not going to predict that thing, but the system is going to tell you whether those two things are compatible or not. And what you do is you, you take an example, uh, of a, you take an image, you get a distorted version of the image, and then you run those two through two neural nets and you train those, the neural nets to produce similar outputs, basically. Now, that's the easy part. The hard part is to make sure they produce different outputs for different uh, input images. Yeah, because there's a trivial solution of everything is the same, so you don't want that. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's called collapse, okay? Uh, uh, regular collapse or informational collapse. Um, basically, the, the two networks happily ignore the input and just produce constant outputs that are always equal, right? So what is the obvious fix for this? And the obvious, there's two, uh, two ways to fix this. The obvious fix that I came up with in 1992-93, uh, there's a paper on this on... Uh, uh, so-called Siamese networks, is to basically have negative samples, right? So you, you show pairs of images that you know are dissimilar, and then you push the two output vectors away from each other with some loss function. Uh, uh, Jeff Hinton had a similar idea, but he was using some measure of mutual information between, uh, between the two outputs. There was uh, papers by Becker and Hinton uh, in the early 90s on this. One of, one of them was actually published in Nature. It was kind of interesting. Um, then I, that idea was pretty much kind of went dormant and then kind of was revived in the mid 2000s also by, by me and Jeff, uh, in sort of more or less independently um, for, for sort of various reasons. You know, this was when deep learning was on the verge of reappearing. So we said maybe it's a good idea to kind of revive this, uh, this idea. Uh, and, and that came back in force in the last few years with uh, a whole bunch of different algorithms that people have proposed so-called contrastive joint embedding, right? Where you, you have those similar and dissimilar pair. Um, one of them actually came out of uh, Jeff Hinton's group at Google. It's called SimClear. Uh, and then there was a whole bunch of them from, uh, from, from Facebook, Perl, Moco, Moco V2, you know, et cetera, SimCM, blah, blah, blah. Um, but there were still kind of contrastive methods. And I don't like contrastive methods because they don't work in high dimension. If you are, it's very hard to kind of, push things away from each other in a high dimensional space, you know, um, the, the curse of dimensionality is against you. And the, the idea there is uh, you basically treat, uh, you, you take augmentations of the same image and those are positive pairs and you take other images as negative pairs. And part of the problem right. is there's a lot of negative pairs. So there's a lot of ways for images to be different from each other. And even if the embedding uh, space in the end has, you know, a couple hundred dimension is still hard, right? So SimClear, for example, takes a very long time to train because of that. And you have to use all kinds of tricks for like hard negative mining and all that stuff, right? So a few ideas popped up, some of them by accident, some of them because people have good intuitions, like, you know, having a predictor, kind of not quite sharing the weights between the two halves, but have the weights of one half be sort of a slowed down version of the weights of the other one using exponential moving average. And then there was the paper by DeepMind, uh, BYOL, bring your own latent, that says, oh, you don't actually need negative samples. You can do it non-contrastively. 
Yeah, I was I was thinking we could go into those uh, actually in a bit more detail because yeah, sure. those those are quite interesting. I think, uh, but before that, um, there was an earlier paper. I think in 2020 there were a lot of these papers that kind of rapidly made progress. Yeah, uh, yeah early on there was Simpler, which was interesting because it's it's a simple framework for contrastive learning, which kind of just took Siamese networks with some tricks and it turned out to work um, with with dot augmentations. And uh, yeah, then there was Suave, which I found pretty interesting. So the idea there yep. is you don't need negative pairs. That was really maybe the first that I've seen where you uh, go away from that. And I think the key idea there is quite interesting. So maybe we can discuss that and the key sure. that works. Right. So, you know, uh, seem clear, like the earlier models from the mid 2000s and, and early 90s uh, is, is contrastive, there's explicit negative pairs, right? Then there are techniques that are based either on quantization or distillation. And it started actually way before Suave by the same team at Facebook AI Research in Paris uh, under Armand Joulin, Piotr Mirowski, um, uh, Piotr uh, Bojanowski, I'm sorry. Mirowski is another person um, from a student of mine who's a deep mind. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, Mathilde Caron, um, uh, who is... Uh, resident PhD student at Fair Paris. And so they had those, those techniques. Uh, one, the, the early one was noise as target. So basically you train a neural net uh, in such a way that every, every training sample is, is its own category. Every training sample with all of its distortions is its own category, okay? And so if you train on ImageNet, you have 1.3 million categories, right? Which is a bit much. And so the next idea was deep cluster, which is to say, well, we don't need 1.3 million uh, categories. We're going to do a k-means clustering in output space and then use whatever prototypes come out of this as our categories. Yeah, so you, you sort of do unsupervised learning to have these quasi-classes, right? Right. I mean, this is unsupervised, right? I mean, the only supervision is the fact that you know that all these torsions of a single image are, you know... Yeah, it's, it's literally image. clustering, yeah. So it's... Right. So... So you run through a neural net, you do this k-means, uh, and then you train basically another copy of the same neural net with those targets to do classification into those, those prototypes. Uh, and they share the weight with the first one, so you can do this iteratively and then kind of work. So there was improvements of this, deep cluster, deep cluster plus, or, uh, or V2. Um, and then Suave is basically an improvement of this where you, you kind of symmetrize it and you kind of have various, various tricks there. Um, so. Those are called either quantization or distillation self supervised learning methods for joint embedding architectures. Um, and at the, you know, right now it's basically what works best. Like, you know, the, the best results on, you know, basically you do a self supervised pre training with ImageNet, let's say, and then you train a, a linear classifier without adjusting the rate of the network and you measure the performance of that linear classifier on ImageNet. Um, the best systems are, you know, in the low 80% 80, 80 uh, correct, and and Suave is pretty much on top of the heap for that. Yeah, exactly. So Suave is, is interesting to get into because uh, this year, a few months ago, uh, there was SEER, which was, uh, I think that just stands for self-supervised learning, uh, where you accomplish something pretty cool, uh, just uh you know, instead of training on just ImageNet, which is a million things with a thousand classes, so it's, it's still somewhat structured. Yeah, you you did uh, training on a bunch more. So can you summarize how that happened? And right, so th this is the SEER experiment um, is based on a, like a system that has been open sourced uh, uh, at the same time called Vissel, which is basically a library for self supervised learning um, from from Facebook. And the experiment that they did was. Uh, you you watch uh, you know public photos from Instagram for an hour and that gives you a billion images or something. But it's not an hour. I don't know how long it takes, but it's very short. And it's just random images, you know, no hashtag, yeah, nothing. It's completely un you know unmanaged and un, um, uh, cared for, if you want. Just you know a billion images from Instagram, random images, and then you train using uh, Suave essentially on on those images, pre-trained. And then you fine tune, uh, or you train a linear head on ImageNet, or you fine tune on ImageNet, or you fine tune on other uh, uh, other tasks, uh, detection, you know, semantic segmentation, whatever. And this system gets like really good, really good performance um, on uh, on all those tasks. You know, surprisingly good. So that's kind of one of the early demonstrations that if you have a big enough 
unlabeled uh, set, you, those techniques will actually give you kind of state of the art performance essentially on on, on vision. So that that really kind of opened the eyes of a lot of people to the possibilities of. SSL finally having a big impact in uh, in computer vision, for sure. Yeah, and, and one of the cool results, uh, if I remember correctly, was you don't you can't just not only fine tune. You can have sort of few shot fine tuning where you don't need that yeah. much data, and yeah. it works really well even in the, in that mode, which you know is a huge impact. As one of the limitations of deep learning, famously, is you need lots of data, which is not always feasible. Right. Well, you need a lot of label data, but now not anymore. You need a lot of data, but you only need a small amount of label data. Yeah, right? exactly. So, the, so one question. So, Suave is sort of sits in between the contrastive and non-contrastive method in the sense that uh, when you train a system to kind of classify into those, you know, prototypes, sort of, you know, f fake categories, if you want, invented categories, virtual categories, uh, you are sort of implicitly doing some doing a bit of uh, of contrastive learning, right? Because you can only give, because of normalization of softmax, you can only give a high score to one category. Automatically, the score of the other ones go down. So there is a bit of an idea of, uh, of contra you know, con contrastive uh, character to that, um, to those approaches. Yeah, you have a positive class for, for your image and augmentations and sort right. of all the other classes are wrong. And that's a good um, point to transition to these other things that you mentioned, BRL and uh, SimCM which both are, are fairly similar and I think are very interesting in that, you know, it, it's not obvious why they should work. Right. So, yeah, maybe uh, can you go into uh, what that is and, and how that came about? Okay, so the, the big question is how do you train those things uh, in such a way that you avoid the collapse, so you avoid the system from sort of finding a trivial solution, but at the same time, you don't want to use contrastive methods, right? You know, there's, there's sort of various ways of doing this. So BOL is a bit of a random intuition and, you know, the people kind of stumbled on it. You, you, the way you can tell they stumbled on it is because the first talks and papers on it just did not explain why it worked. In fact, there is a paper at ICML uh, by people from, from Fair yeah, and Chan. Understanding uh, sort of Self-Supervised Learning Dynamics, which just came out. I just saw it yesterday. It came out and won uh, an honorable mention for best paper at ICML just uh, yesterday. And in fact, it's an explanation for why it works. Um, so th there's various uh, attempts. There are people from DeepMind also saying, oh, it's normalization. Oh, no, it's not normalization, blah, 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 or in bash norm and everything. So, uh, you know, I encourage you to read those papers. Uh, normalization has to do, has something to do with it, actually. But, and, and, and you know, CMCM is kind of a different way of, uh, of, 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 of handling this, but it doesn't collapse for probably similar reasons. But what I'm actually more excited about is other non-contrastive methods, uh, which of course I'm biased because they came out of my group at Facebook, but uh, but I think they they don't collapse and we know why. <laughs> um, and, and they're based on essentially uh, maximizing a measure of mutual information between those two outputs. And this is an old idea because that's the idea that Jeff Hinton was using back in 1992 with Sue Becker and that he revived in the, in the 2000s to some extent. So this idea that if you have two networks and they observe kind of two parts of the same image or two different sections of a video or whatever, and you, you, you train them to maximize the mutual information between them, they're not going to collapse because their information they carry needs to be as large as possible, but they're going to extract whatever is common between those two inputs, okay? So if you have two distorted versions of the same image, what's common between them is the content. It's the nature of the object that's in it, right? Now, the next question you might ask is, how do you measure information content, you know, mutual information between two variables? And that's where things become difficult because mutual information has a clear definition, but it doesn't have a clear way of estimating it. It's like a probability distribution. If I give you a bunch of points and I ask you what's the distribution those points came from, you cannot answer that question. It exists, you but how do you answer. get it? Yeah. <laughs> right, you need a model, right? Yeah. You need a model of a distribution uh, that allows you to basically interpolate from a, or extrapolate even from a finite number of points. And you have exactly the same problem with mutual information. You need a distribution underneath to estimate it, and you need to make hypotheses about the distribution. If you do it wrong, your system will just break your assumptions and not actually do what you want. Uh, that's a problem that Jeff actually encountered uh, back in the 90s. So, um, uh, so the, the basic idea of, uh, so there's two methods. One is called uh, Barlow Twins, and the other one is called Vicreg, and they're very similar in many ways. I like Vicreg uh, uh, a little better because 
it's it we, we know exactly why it doesn't collapse at least we have a explicit provision for why it doesn't collapse um, and the idea is very simple you you have to, you have those two networks they don't need to have shared weights they don't need to be identical they don't need to be looking at the same thing one could be looking at images the other one at audio for, for example so you don't have this constraint that all the, those other methods have that the weights need to be shared between the two networks right so here there's two different networks they produce two uh, vectors call them embedding um, you, you minimize the square distance, essentially, between them, okay? Either with a normalization or without, but uh, VCREG doesn't need normalization, Barlow Twins does. Um, so you minimize the distance between them, so that does not prevent collapse. So you have another criterion that maximizes the information content in each of those vectors. And VCREG and Barlow Twins do this with, uh, slightly differently, but with the same basic idea. The, same, the, the basic idea is that you want the variance of each of the variables of both of those vectors to be non-zero, to be something, it doesn't matter what it is, but it mm -hmm. needs to be- So it's not just constant, zero. right? Right, so it can't just collapse and be constant, right? You, you, you penalize it for being constant over a batch, let's say. Um, and then the second thing is that the system can still cheat because it can produce basically the same value for all the components of the vector, right? And the vector would be, not informative at all. So some people have called this uh, dimensional collapse. Mm. I prefer to call this informational collapse because uh, it's a bit more general. And so the idea from Barlow Twins that Vic Craig also uses is to decorrelate every pair of variables between them. So you compute the covariance matrix of, uh, of those vectors and you have a, a term in your cost function that says, I want the off -diagonal, off diagonal terms of this covariance matrix to be as close to zero as possible. And that works. Interesting. Uh, it works as well as, you know, Suave and... So, so the next year could be potentially based on these approaches? Possibly. Right. So Suave works a little bit better because it can take advantage of something called multi-crop, which is sort of a very aggressive type of uh, 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 data augmentation. And and uh, methods like like Vicreg and and others don't actually work very well with uh, with multicrop. So Suave is a bit of an advantage there. But the big advantage that Vicreg has is that it doesn't need the two halves to be shared, and so it's applicable to all kinds of situations that uh, other methods basically cannot be applied to. And so I'm really hopeful that you know some versions of this or some successor of this will be kind of a general tool that we can use for self supervised learning in all kinds of situations. Cool. Yeah. So we're, we're getting into pretty state of the art stuff. It was just came out this year and it's interesting to hear because yeah, with SimCM, BLL, you, you have this L2 metric when you have two positive pairs and then you have, you train one network, you sort of don't exactly train the other, but it still isn't clear. So having an exact objective to make sure there's no collapse kind of right. makes sense. Um, Great. So we covered kind of the last two years-ish or year and a half and, and yeah, have gone into why self supervised learning is really making strides in vision. And that also makes me ask, this uh, thing with BRL and SimCM uh, is interesting in that it's another example where something works in practice first, and then later we have an explanation of why, right? And there's been all these discussions about deep learning being alchemy. Uh, and I found your your talks on this very interesting, where you, you address this topic and, and show that maybe it's not a bad thing. So yeah, could you uh, describe kind of your view with respect to these sorts of uh, things that happen in deep learning? Right, so this was a little triggered by, uh, you know, uh, a talk that Ali Rahimi gave at NetNerips a few years ago, you know, when they won the, 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 the test of time award, right? And um, uh, so claiming that deep learning was alchemy and, you know, other methods in machine learning were better justified and easier to understand uh, theoretically. And I, I really kind of got riled up because the, so we had an exchange with Ali on various social networks and which I think was a very interesting and constructive discussion. And, you know, uh, 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 my argument was there is a lot of examples in history where technology preceded uh, theory. And it's, in fact, very rare that theory actually suggests uh, a, a practical thing. It happens, of course, and there are famous examples, but, but very often the practice, actually, the engineering, if you want, precedes the, the science or the, certainly the, the theory that justifies it. 
The best example of this is uh, the steam engine. So the steam engine was invented in the late 1600s in various forms and was developed over the next century. Uh, and thermodynamics was not developed in the form that we know it today until the early 19th century. So it took 100 years for thermodynamics to basically explain what the limitations of thermal engines uh, uh, are. And, you know, there are other examples in, uh, you know, optics, for example, the, the telescope and the microscopes were invented before Newton figured out the laws of diffraction. Uh, it wasn't Newton, actually, it was Snell. And, and you know, people claim there were, like, you know, similar work in, uh, in the Middle Ages in the, in the Arab world, uh, although it wasn't expressed in kind of the same way. But um, so... You know, it's very, very common that a, technolog a technological artifact pops up and then, and then kind of you know, it kind of triggers people's interest in it and they try to explain where it works. And in the process of doing so, they come up with a theory that is much more general than the stuff they set out to explain. Thermodynamics is the basis of physics and biology and just about everything, right? So, I mean, it's like the, the science of science, if you want. Um, and so, so it's interesting. Um, so, you know, what is the equivalent of thermodynamics for intelligence? Artificial or natural, by the way, um, or, 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 or for learning, even if we want to be a little more restrictive, right? Is it uh, the classical uh, statistical learning theory, like the vatnik chervonenkis type um, learning theory, or is there something more um, that we can say? Yeah, and that that is a harder question than, you know, I, I suppose building something at works, which we've been doing for a decade of deep learning. And, right. and in a sense, deep learning is an example of this, where no one expected these giant neural nets to actually... Well, not no one, like some of us did. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. But it, it wasn't, there was no explanation for why a big neural net with just stochastic gradient descent would work in theory. But it did work. That's true. And then the theory is coming out sort of now or starting right. to come. Yeah. I mean, there are phenomena that, that we, we knew about in the early 90s. We could not really kind of, you know, write them down theoretically. But the phenomenon, for example, that you make a network bigger and, you know, every statistical textbook tells you this would not work as well because it's overparameterized. Uh, and in practice, those bigger networks were actually working better. The bigger you made the network, the bigger it worked, the better it worked. Um, there's another thing that says, oh, you have a non-convex objective function. It will never converge, right? You have no guarantees. Uh, and the solution to this was to make the network big also. And it turns out if you make the network big, you know, the, the local minima problem is actually not a problem. The, the system will find a minimum. You'll find a different one every time, but you don't care because they're all equivalent pretty much. And people are starting to understand this on the theoretical level. There is the phenomenon of double descent, right, where... Uh, you know, if you have a, a tiny neural net and you increase its uh, size, you know, you, there's a point at which the test error doesn't, you know, goes bad. Uh, and that's just when the network has just the right size for the problem uh, or you, the model, whatever it is. But then if you make the model much bigger than the necessary size and, and it's a neural net, doesn't work for other models, the generalization error is, uh, goes down again. So there's this sort of double dip. And this breaks everything you read in every t statistical textbooks. Okay. Um, why? <laughs> I mean, so we, we, we now understand, you know, some of, you know, some reasons of why, why this, why this occurs, but, uh, but there was a lot of disbelief. Um, so that suggests something that's very important from the heuristic point of view, which is that, um, uh, I mean, certainly understanding, theoretically understanding what you're doing is very important. Understanding intuitively what you're doing is even more important. Okay. But then also that if you limit yourself to working with models that you understand theoretically, you're basically limiting yourself a lot in the sense that there's a lot of things you will not consider touching just because you don't understand them th uh, theoretically. You're basically shooting yourself in the foot. <laughs> so, you know, it's not because you don't understand something theoretically, you shouldn't do it. Um, there are some limits to this, but, um, but that's kind of a general rule. And the, the machine learning community you know, until the, the kind of deep learning revolution, if you want, from the mid '90s to the, the late uh, 2010, early 2000, uh, early 2010, I'm sorry, um, was basically kind of in that mindset that you know your network is way overparameterized, your cost function is non-convex, you you don't even have an explicit regularizer. This cannot possibly work. Like all my theory tells you, this cannot possibly work. And you would show people, you say, but it does work. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, but, CNNs you know, were state of art in the 90s, right? Right. They say, oh, it's a fluke. You know? uh -huh. uh, so, you know, reality as a way of 
bringing you back to reality. Yeah, yeah. And in AI, it's it's interesting. It's kind of a field where you are building something. You know, we are trying to replicate some aspects of intelligence at the same time as we are studying it. So, you know, yeah. theory can come from practice or vice versa. And it's not. But there, is, but there is something to be said for, you know, trying to sort of keep things simple in the sense of uh, not having too many moving parts, not coming up with some, you know, arbitrary rule because you think it's uh, it's a cool thing on, or it just produces, you know, 0.2% better performance on whatever you just did. Uh, you know, there, there is some limit to tinkering. Then you can very quickly devolve into into alchemy. And, just full on and, engineering, uh, not really research at that point. Right, yeah. right, right. But, but, but not good engineering, <laughs> you know, bad engineering, which is, you know, you end up with, Words and tricks to kind of make everything work, which you know may not be the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a really interesting point that maybe not enough people appreciate. Uh, so I, I have always found it interesting. And then, uh, yeah, going off of that, you know, there's this point. You know, obviously, deep learning works and works really well and works increasingly well in many areas. So for instance, now in vision, uh, self-supervision. So uh, obviously you are a director of uh, FAIR. Um, and I think, it, yeah, aside from just the research side, I'm curious what you think are the most exciting ways in which, uh, I suppose, especially when Facebook, deep learning is being applied and actually used to improve the world and improve you know, how things work. Right. Okay. So first, uh, uh, slight correction. I'm not director of yeah. uh, FAIR uh, anymore. I'm, I'm chief scientist, which means I don't have to manage people. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. I, I can do my own research. I advise a lot of groups on various research projects, but I don't actually run anything. So I was doing this for three and a half years. Uh, and you know, I, you know, I see time running out and I have a lot of uh, research ideas to try and I, I, I just didn't have time to do this while I was running FAIR. So that was one reason to change uh, job. The main reason though, is that I'm actually a pretty terrible administrator. So, and you know, I didn't want to spend my time, <laughs> my life doing it. So, um, uh, so I think it was better for people who are better at it. Um, so the current directors of FAIR, uh, are, are Joël Pinault and, um, uh, and Antoine Bord. They, they, they actually direct sort of two separate parts of FAIR. So FAIR was recently reorganized. It's got a part called FAIR Labs, which is sort of very sort of scientist-driven bottom-up type research, and FAIR Excel, which Antoine Bord uh, leads, which is more kind of a little more directed, if you want, so the bigger projects. Um, they're not applied necessarily, uh, at least at all, actually, but they're ambitious projects that need to have like more engineering support and be a little more organized. And then next to FAIR, there's another organization called... Uh, uh, Facebook AI Applied Research, which uh, which is more focused on internal applications of uh, of AI to to Facebook, in partnership with product groups and various other things. And there are two other groups within Facebook AI. One which is based on which is called AI Experience. So it's basically kind of designing new ideas, new product concepts that are AI first, if you want. And then another one which is called Responsible AI, which is about like you know how do we make sure AI is is safe, is you know fair, you know, things like that, right? Um, and uh, whenever it's deployed and, and things like that. So these are the, the four groups within Facebook AI. That's organization with um, over a thousand people and something like that. Fair itself is about 400, 400 or 500. Um, and applications of uh, AI at Facebook. Now, I've been fond to say uh, over the last uh, year or so that if you take deep learning out of Facebook, the company essentially crumbles. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's true of Google as well and, and YouTube. And, you know, um, they, it's, it's all built around it now. Like, you know, all the, all the news feed, all the content filtering, all the, um, you know, uh, spam, clickbait filter, you know, all, the, all that stuff, you know, that's, that's all, it's all based on deep learning. Translation, you know, OCR, you have to do OCR if you want to do content filtering properly. Uh, assessing whether uh, uh, an ad, for example, that you know people want to show on Facebook uh, is you know satisfies all the conditions that an ad has to satisfy. There's a lot of kind of things that uh, uh, need to be satisfied for ads to be shown. Uh, whether something is hate speech or not, whether something is uh, bullying, whether uh, um, you know uh, whether it's uh, 
nudity, you know, whatever, like all this stuff, you know, all any, content. any bad thing, any good thing, all of it is, is AI at this point. It's all, it's all deep learning. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of other things also, you know, on top of deep learning, but, uh, but the core of it is all, is all deep learning. So, um, so there's, there's a lot, a lot of that, like every photo that is uploaded on Facebook and Instagram goes to, you know, a couple uh, comments that mm -hmm. are used for various things. Uh, there's this copy detection. There is, uh, you know, you want to block terrorist propaganda, right? So some extremist group posts, uh, you know, propaganda video where they cut someone's head or something. You don't want that to be distributed, right? So if it's not detected uh, automatically before it's being shown to people, it's going to get flagged. And then when it's flagged, you want, you know, there's going to be sympathizers of that group that want to repost that video in various kind of distorted forms. And so you need to be able to detect all of those distorted versions. So you take them down before they're being shown. Um, so that idea of, uh, you know, basically approximate copy detection, it's, um, it's something that Facebook does a lot. So there's a, a huge amount of resources, in fact, that is devoted to, uh, at Facebook, to, devoted to a lot of the things that people accuse Facebook of not doing. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, like, <laughs> yeah. it's like literally thousands of people working on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. These are hard problems, right? And AI is, is making it, is. it better. It, it, yeah. And it can't possibly be perfect. I mean, certainly not with the technology that we have, but it's made enormous amounts of progress. So, for example, hate speech detection three years ago, you know, of all the, not, not all of hate speech is, is necessarily taken down, right? But uh, the hate speech that um, when someone, you know, when a, a piece of hateful speech is posted, um, it goes through an automatic de uh, detection system that either takes it down or flags it for a human to examine, uh, a moderator, or doesn't do anything and just, you know, lets it uh, go through. That's generally a, a problem, okay? Um, a, false, a false negative detection. So when the thing goes through, eventually it gets flagged by users. So users will say, uh, this is hate speech, right? Um, and then it's being examined by human moderators and they decide to take it down or not, right? So, so among all of the things that are eventually taken down, you know, three years ago, about 20, 25% was taken down automatically, uh, preemptively before people would see it, right? Mm -hmm. With AI techniques of various kinds. Now it's 97.5% uh, or something like that. And that's basically entirely due, not entirely, but mostly due to progress in uh, NLP, for example, in, you know, basically using transformers pre-trained with, you know, denoising a toy coder method, mm -hmm. you know. You know, Bert and friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah, anyone. Uh, there's still this meme that comes up. I think every once in a while of like, oh, well, we have an AI, another AI winter, and given Google and Facebook are based on AI, it seems doubtful at this point. Yeah, it's doubtful. I mean, there there, there might be a, a mini a mini winter, but not for everyone. Not for people who are who know what they're doing and are not sort of claiming ridiculous things, but there might be a mini winter for people who a few years ago said, oh, you know, AGI is around the corner, you know, within five years we'll have, you know, AGI systems, or AGI is just a matter of scaling up current algorithms, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, reward is enough, you know, we just need to scale up uh, reinforcement learning and figure out how to accelerate it. So those claims, I think, are just wrong. Uh, I think we need new concepts for reaching uh, I don't like the term AGI. I don't think AGI exists. Like human level intelligence. Right. Human level intelligence or, or you know, I'd be happy with like, you know, the same intelligence as a cat or a dog, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, within my, my sort of, before the end of my career, if you want. Um, but uh, so human, you know, human level intelligence is, you know, some, you know, sometime after that. But, um, but human intelligence is very specialized. And so... I, I don't believe in the concept of general intelligence. Yeah, so the hype, you know, has to die down. It's been pretty exponential, but progress will continue at this point for sure. Yeah, and but we need, uh, you know, some somewhat, you know, breakthroughs in the domain, you know, in the domain of self-supervised learning, for example. So basically, allowing systems to learn world models. Right, the essence of intelligence really is the ability to predict. So, particularly predict. Uh, what's going to happen in the world as a consequence of your actions, because that's what allows you to plan. Mm -hmm. And so we, or if we can train machines to predict what's going to happen in the world, uh, including as a consequence of their actions, then we'll have made a big step towards uh, more intelligent systems. Maybe systems that have some level of common sense, um, you know, 
Yeah. yeah. Some level of intelligence approaching that of a cat or a dog. <laughs> Eventually, we'll see how long it takes. Yeah, sure. uh, but it's hard. Yeah. I work in robotics, so, you know. Right, right, yeah. right. My, my, my condolences. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit behind LP and CV in terms of how easy things are. But maybe this decade, we'll, we'll get there. Um, yeah, so that's great to hear. As chief AI scientist, I assume that you are working on the research and the ideas to get us to cat level intelligence. Um, so I'm excited to see what FAIR produces in the coming years and then what's been produced uh, in the prior years of, uh, in terms of self supervised learning. And yeah, I think that kind of wraps it up for us. So thanks again for this really interesting interview. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Well, the pleasure was mine. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me on. All righty. And just uh, let me do our outro. Once again, this is The Gradient Podcast. Check out our associated magazine over at thegradient.pub. If you enjoyed this interview, please support us by sharing it and subscribing and reviewing and all of that. Thank you for listening and be sure to tune into our future episodes.